In this video, I'll be covering digestion and absorption, which is topic 6.1 in IB biology. There are five stages that food that is eaten undergoes. Ingestion is a physical intake of the food into the mouth. Digestion is the breakdown of the food into its monomeric units using mechanical and chemical processes. Absorption is the uptake of the monomeric units into the bloodstream. Assimilation is the process through which the cells throughout the body uptake the monomeric units from the bloodstream for metabolism. And lastly, the food that is not metabolized or uptaken is ingested from the body. The digestive system is made up of two components. The alimentary canal, which is essentially the tube with a hollow through which food passes through, and the accessory glands, which secrete the necessary digestive juices or hormones for the food to be digested, absorbed, or assimilated properly. The alimentary canal is made up of the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. The accessory glands are the salivary glands, liver, and gallbladder, and the pancreas. Let's begin with ingestion. Food is placed in the mouth and is chewed, which is called mastication. This mechanically breaks apart the food into smaller pieces. Amylase is also secreted by the salivary glands, which begin the hydrolysis or breakdown of starch. The pH, which I will represent in green, is slightly basic. Next, this chewed semi-liquid food, now called a bolus, is passed down the esophagus, where it is pushed using movements of smooth muscle into the stomach. This is called peristalsis, which is the coordinated contraction of antagonistic longitudinal and circular muscles. This means that when the longitudinal muscles are relaxed, the circular muscles above the bolus contract. Once the bolus reaches the stomach, hydrochloric acid is secreted by the cells lining the stomach, so the pH is very acidic, ranging from 1.5 to 2.5. These extreme conditions kill any pathogens and also denature a lot of the proteins found in the food. Pepsin, which has an optimal pH in this range, is also secreted by the cells, which begins the digestion of protein. The bolus is further mechanically digested while it is churned in the gastric juice. After spending about two to four hours in the stomach, the food, now called chyme, is emptied into the C-shaped part of the small intestine, the duodenum. The gallbladder and pancreas are attached to it with the pancreatic duct. When the cells in the duodenum sense that chyme has entered, the pancreas secretes a basic pancreatic juice containing the digestive enzymes pancreatic amylase, lipase, and uh, different proteases. This is mixed with bile that is secreted from the gallbladder. The pancreas has another function of secreting the hormones insulin and glucagon into the bloodstream in response to food. The chyme in the duodenum is slightly basic with a pH of 7.2 to 7.5. But returning to the bile, it is a liquid containing bile salts that emulsify lipids in the food by breaking apart the fat globules into smaller particles by forming micelles around them. Let's examine the hydrolysis of polymers closer. Protein's primary structure, which is a series of amino acids fused with peptide bonds, is broken using endo- and exopeptidases. Pepsin and trypsin are endopeptidases, which are enzymes that act upon peptide bonds in the middle of chains between non-terminal amino acids. Exopeptidases can only break off the terminal amino acids. Both types of enzymes result in dipeptides being formed, which are the substrates of dipeptidase. In the end, amino acids are formed. Starch is made of monosaccharides like glucose bonded with glycosidic linkages to create amylase, which has 1,4 bonds, or amylopectin, which also has 1,6 bonds. Amylase can break down 1,4 bonds in starch, but not the 1,6 bonds. It also doesn't react with polysaccharides that have broken down into disaccharides. 
These small compounds, like dextrin and maltose, are broken down by enzymes immobilized in the epithelial cells of the small intestine, such as maltase, lactase, and sucrase. Lipids are contained in fat globules, which are broken apart with bile salts. Triglycerides and phospholipids are then broken down into glycerol, fatty acid chains, and phosphate. Once digestion has finished, the monomeric units must be absorbed. This occurs in the jejunum and ileum of the small intestine. This is a cross-sectional representation of the small intestine. The outermost layer is the serosa, which is made of connective tissue. The muscle layer consists of longitudinal and circular muscles that take part in peristalsis. The submucosa is a layer that supports the mucosa and contains venules that branch out into capillaries in the mucosa. The mucosa is the innermost layer, which is thrown into finger-like projections called villi that partake in the actual absorption. This increases the surface area for absorption. Here is a zoomed-in drawing of a villus. The outer layer of cells is the epithelium. Inside the villus, there is a protrusion of a lymphatic vessel called the lacteal. Surrounding it is a network of blood capillaries. Goblet cells in the epithelium secrete mucus into the lumen of the small intestine. Also keep in mind that a villus also has projections in the cell membrane called microvilli, which further increase the surface area. Let's return to the purpose of these villi, which is to absorb. The nutrients that they absorb include monosaccharides, amino acids, the constituents of lipids, which are glycerol and fatty acids, and bases of nucleotides. Additionally, components that require no breakdown are mineral ions like sodium and vitamins are also absorbed. A lot of these pass through the epithelial cells through diffusion down their concentration gradients. For example, glycerol and fatty acids pass through the cell membrane easily because they're hydrophobic. In the epithelial cell, they are reassembled into triglyceride and transported in a lipoprotein into the lacteal. Next, as one of the most important energy sources of the body is glucose, the body cannot rely on diffusion, because the glucose must be extracted from the food to the fullest extent, so it undergoes a special uptake process. After glucose has diffused into the cells, there is an equal concentration of it in the lumen and inside the cell. To pull more glucose in, a co-transport is used. This is a form of passive transport that exploits the abundance of sodium ions in the lumen to transport the low concentration of glucose. The sodium ions travel down their concentration gradients, pulling glucose along with them. To maintain the sodium concentration gradient, two potassium ions are actively pumped from outside the cell in exchange for three sodium ions. This requires ATP. The glucose diffuses into the blood capillary. The blood capillaries in the villi connect into venules, which pour into the hepatic portal vein that transports all blood from the intestines into the liver, where the levels of nutrients are regulated and stored, and toxic materials are metabolized and expelled. The permeability of the small intestine can be replicated using dialysis or visking tubing. Both the intestine and dialysis tubing are selectively permeable, meaning that they only allow small molecules to pass through. Experiments can be designed to model the process of diffusion of various substances. For example, the tubing, which is filled with a solution containing starch, can be placed into a beaker with iodine, which is a starch indicator. Iodine is naturally reddish-brown. After some time, the contents of the tubing would turn purple because the pores in the tubing are large enough to allow iodine to pass through. Iodine turns purple in the presence of starch. The liquid outside the beaker would remain brown because starch is too large to pass through the pores in the tubing. Let's return to the passage of food in the digestive system. The last stages of absorption occur in the large intestine, where the water is reuptaken and bacteria finish carbohydrate hydrolysis and produce vitamins. The rectum stores the feces that have been formed, which are then ejected through the anus. Do not confuse ejection with excretion. While ejection is the removal of undigested waste food, excretion is the elimination of waste products of metabolism. 
and that's basically it thank you for watching and i hope this video helped you to learn about the topic 6.1 in ib biology or just learn about digestion if you're not in ib thanks for watching